Hi, this is Carol Salter and I'm here to read some more of my book, Witch on the Warpath. Um, today we're on chapter four. I hope you've been following along. And remember, you can subscribe free um, in case you want to catch any of the other chapters. So, chapter four, pretty. Pretty, 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 pretty. Onk was still repeating the word over and over as he left his waterside home a few days later. Most days, Onk's first thought was about consuming large quantities of food, but not on recent mornings. For the first time in his life, food was Onk's third thought, and it resulted in a subtle shift of his prehistoric thought processes. If we delved inside a troll's brain, we might solve one of the magic realm's mysteries. How do trolls think? Experts theorise that a troll's mind is so vast, their thoughts probably slide into other dimensions. It's clear a troll's brainwaves are deep and profound, despite their lack of high vocabulary skills. The wizard Azukinus, attempting to study this phenomenon, afterwards told his colleagues, I would liken it to staggering around a vast castle searching for the exit, while words like food, fight and pretty surround you in letters 50 feet high. That's not all. Each word falls, hitting you on the head till you're squashed flat, hammered into the ground as other words like water and the ever-frightening toilet take their place. It's a waking nightmare of death by large, short letters. The only experience I have which comes close is standing inside a huge jar of wasps who don't realise they can sing, sting you and instead hum happy birthday over and over. In other words, terrifying to the point of insanity. Azukilus was committed to the local sanatorium a few weeks later after being found trying to stuff a pig inside a revolving door. In his defence, he stated he was spinning it with magic to see if pigs could really fly and weren't just pretending otherwise. Regardless of the change in the order of Onk's thoughts processes, a troll needed to eat. So, as he thought about the pretty from his dream and imagined it perched on top of his beautiful hat, Onk's feet wound their own way to breakfast, taking the troll's mind along for a ride. Mornings weren't for scavenging behind the local supermarket. That was for evening meals and nibbles. Breakfast instead came from the local authority refuge tip and added an overripe eggy smell to Onk's unique body odour. Great discoveries were found at the council tip, for humans were wasteful beings in the extreme. They threw out whole sections of their cooked breakfast, including bacon rinds and burnt toast edges. But private household refuge was not Onk's destination. It offered far too meagre pickings. Onk, along with other city trolls and a few seagulls, knew the best breakfast offerings came from the business refuge collections. Transport cafe bins to be exact. Staff emptied their customers' waste food into huge industrial containers at the rear of their premises. These bins were emptied once a week by refuge workers, or more correctly by their vehicles, for this was the era of health and safety and litigation obsession. Expensive automated machinery reduced the risk of back injuries to refuge staff. The correct colour-coded bin was wheeled into place behind the lorry, lifted by hydraulic pumps and tipped into the moor of the hulking leviathan, making the men all but redundant. Gone were the strong, 
broad-backed men who made housewives sigh and boys stare in admiration as they flexed bulging arm muscles, heaving silver dustbins over their shoulders like they weighed no more than a roll of toilet paper. In today's hydraulic-powered world, men such as these were surplus to requirements, making sallow-faced skinny men with pot bellies the norm. Every day, at least 10 cafe bins were on the menu and some provided better fare than others. It didn't follow that food considered delicious to humans was appealing to Onk and his fellow diners. They sought the choicest, grease-laden, fattest leftovers available, dripping in dripping and swimming in lard. Food! Onk growled, his mouth turning up at the edges as he located the refuge he hunted before anyone else could get a look in. Scrabbling over the waste pile, Onk grabbed his prize, originating from North London's Happy Fatso Cafe in the West End Lane. To prevent litigation, the name has been altered. Fairy folk from miles around knew of these auspicious premises, guaranteed to supply the greatest concentration of overcooked grease per ounce of waste. Unknown to the proprietors, the happy fatso held the proud distinction of the highest death rate for cardiac disease in the Greater London area for the last 10 years. Its record outstripping its nearest competitor, the crusty Conry, name also changed to prevent legal issues, by a whopping 142 fatalities. Human researchers never considered triangulating places that people frequented, together with cardiac disease and death. Fairies had. Statisticians were catching up, recognising fast food as a risk, but they were a long way from naming individual establishments. Another example overlooked by human experts that positively screamed danger to the magical races included roads which were the riskiest. Humans recorded the end location of a tragic event like a mugging or a murder, while fairies triangulated the route in between. They identified certain roads that contributed to a person's risk of mishap. If these routes were avoided, it reduced the risk of harm notably. Human research biased by sponsorship deals and subject to individual interpretation meant it would be decades before humans figured these facts out. They just discovered risk assessment and what a mess they were making of that concept. Fairies called it the don't do anything at all in case there's a 1 in 20 billion risk assessment. They concluded humans seem to have lost their way regarding the perception of risk. Risky for humans didn't mean risky for magical creatures in such as the case of trolls and grease. Magic folk had their own risky areas. For example, the riskiest place to be seen by humans included the bottom of the garden, the toadstool ring and the end of the rainbow. The last of which no human alive today had managed to reach. Decades ago, an aspiring young author named J.M. Berry achieved this feat by fooling two simple-minded orcs. Since his quick-witted scam, no one had come close to discovering the location of real magic. Onk sat down on a broken sink to enjoy his luxury breakfast. Two kilos of fat scrapings with crispy flies on the side. His gastronomic feast also included the infamous greasy bits. These were the scrapings of the blackened griddle plate pushed over the side by the cook whilst clearing following a cooking bonanza of bacon, eggs and other fatty goods. Onk had won a good fight with Gank, another city troll for these morsels. 
Gank shuffled away from the sink unit, sporting a throbbing black eye and a bruised fat lip for his pains. He wasn't entirely unhappy. He had an awesome visage and this new injury enhanced his appeal. In troll circles, the uglier a troll, the more attractive he was to the opposite sex. And Gank enjoyed the attention of the fairer sex a great deal. He was a bit peeved Onk hadn't increased the size of his striking cauliflower ear. The ear in question bent over at right angles like an underwater flowered. It was misshapen and swollen through constant fighting and Gank was enormously proud of it. Gank loved females admiring his ear. He didn't use words but he purred as the ladies flicked and stroked it. Using his sausage-sized and blacked fingers, Onk scooped the congealed mess out of the white carrier bag where it had been dumped by some spotty, underpaid teenage waitress. The breakfast smelt almost human, making a change from his usual culinary delights. Fat seldom goes mouldy, but it can go rancid in the heat. The smell permeated up around Onk's attire, blending with the casual aroma of last week's dead cat and yesterday's squashed rock dove. It lingered on the rim of his jaunty crimson headwear like a statement of his eccentricity. Midday found Onk ambling through the ploughed field at the back of the local tip after his humongous breakfast. His stomach, distended with food, hung out in front of him. His belly button protruded like a pregnant woman's as it pointed the way across the furrows. As Onk sauntered, he kicked the army of neat rows of soil into oblivion with his shovel-sized feet. He'd acquired a new thought in his potato-shaped head during breakfast and he was following it to its natural conclusion. Earlier that morning, before his gigantic meal, he'd spied an interesting section towards the rear of the tip. It appeared at first glance to be nothing more than a heap of broken orange house bricks. But Onk's intuition told him he'd find treasure within the pile. The bricks hadn't been there two days ago. Onk knew he could count to two. It was always one more than this one, which he could say by pointing. The area required further investigation before another city troll clapped their greedy eyes on it. This section of the tip was being used to dump redundant soil, rubble and concrete from a demolished housing estate where a new five-lane five -lane highway was soon to be built. Onk trod across the settling spoil heap, his belly gurgling, his deep blue eyes scanning the ground beneath for booty. Halfway across the rubble, he raised his eyes to navigate over a treacherous piece of debris when he noticed something black and white on the far side. Three silly magpies were squabbling, the sound akin to toddlers fighting over chocolate buttons. They were perched on a large piece of concrete, arguing over some object they'd found. Their raucous screeching voices carried across the distance to Onk. Their plumage displayed a riot of black and white as they jockeyed for position over the object at their toes. Each extended his wings wide, flapping them to intimidate and distract the other two. It didn't work. Next to them, leaning over at an angle of 45 degrees, were the remains of an old rusty lamppost. Onk watched the spectacle, trying to make out what the birds were arguing over. He guessed they'd been arguing over food, maybe a baby bird, since this was one of the magpie's favourite delicacies. Onk wondered whether to bother doing anything about the annoying birds. He wasn't hungry. The smell of rancid cooked breakfast filled the air as he burped mouth-wide into the wind. 
Something inside his head niggled when he turned back around towards the main tip. It felt uncomfortable, like nettle rash in his brain. So, for reasons he couldn't understand, he decided to investigate the focus of the magpie's attentions. Onk worked his way in their direction, using his best, I'm not really interested in what you're doing, approach. Or so he thought. The result was an exaggerated gait, which made him look like a sailor returning home after ten years on board ship. The sick, sea-sickening, swaying, sideways effect was complemented by his bloated stomach stretching out in front of him like a galleon without a sail. As a troll, Onk wasn't an easy individual to miss. When he was moving and trying to pretend he wasn't, it was even more noticeable. The magpies should have noticed, but they didn't, to their terminal misfortune. They stood facing the opposite way, their tails towards him. Their earlobes, like most birds, were positioned in the side of their heads. They should have heard him come in, but they were too engrossed in their fight and they didn't hear Onk till it was too late. Caught up with their bickering, they remained oblivious to the troll's approach despite his heavy weaving tread. As Onk drew nearer, he spied the object causing so much animosity. A tiny pink speck. Each bird rolled the tiny prize this way and that way with their beak, trying to manoeuvre it away from its adversary. Onk came near enough to recognise the object at the centre of the magpie's attention. His brain stepped up a gear to emergency level, the equivalent of being six steps behind a tractor without tyres going uphill in first gear. And with gusto he bellowed, Wah! 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 He found this usually did the trick with birds, scaring them witless. He knew the magic effect of sounds. Onk had learnt the strategy watching babies and toddlers in the park with their parents. He saw the sound for what it was, a word of awesome power. Mothers would weep and sometimes faint at the sound. Fathers, grown men, would tremble at the knees and give in to their infant's demands. And the infant would receive a special treat in return for the momentous display. This powerful sound had the same effect on the three squabbling magpies as it did when uttered by children. It scared off two of the birds and caused the third to keel over backwards in a fatal swoon, resulting in a comical sight of it flipped on its back, propped up on its tail, with both legs sticking up in the air. Onk, assuming the bird had died from his magic sound, bashed it on the head, hard. Thus the bird became very dead, very quickly. Onk didn't kill animals to eat, but he sure took advantage of death by natural causes. He wasn't afraid to offer a mercy blow either for those who hadn't died quite fast enough, especially if they were on his dinner menu. Magpie was a bit chewy and had a distinct gamey flavour, but to Onk it was all food. After dispatching the bird, Onk swept one huge woolly arm down towards the concrete, collecting the mystery item. With the dead magpie by his side, he sat on the dusty mound of grey concrete, leaning against the bent lamp post, bending it even further with his weight to survey his reward. Pretty, pretty, he sighed, his eyes smiling, his mouth in a wide sloppy grin. Here, in his massive paw of a hand, with sausages for fingers and covered in thick black grease, was the thing of his dreams. It was a tiny pink bubble of light, with something tinier sleeping and breathing inside. The sparkly light has attracted the magpies ever on the hunt for shiny things. 
For a nanosecond, Onk wondered whether to eat it. But despite of his slow thinking brain, he registered that it was alive and off his dinner menu. It was the pretty of his dreams. Looking at the cocoon soothed his mind. Having it close made him think warm thoughts. With much reverence, he placed the cocoon on top of his bizarre red hat where it could be near his head. Then he promptly forgot about it for a while as a more pressing need exerted itself. Sleep claimed Onk. The word of power had drained his energy. Either that or the big breakfast had caught up with him. As regular as the sun, it was time for Onk's afternoon nap and nothing and no one was going to stop it. He stretched his arms way over his head, pushing the rusty lamppost even further back into a horizontal position behind him, till it lay almost parallel to the ground. His arms dropped to his side, his mouth opened to give the most amazing roar of a yawn, big enough to fit at least 20 magpies inside. Onk lay at the back of Hampstead Heath refuge tip on the tilted, dusty concrete in the weak autumn sunshine, a picture of tranquil inactivity. His deep, penetrating snores vibrated the broken metal girders inside the concrete, the sound echoing around the area like a faulty kanga drill. The tiny fairy slept on snuggled in a fold near the brim of Onk's unique red hat. Later that afternoon, magical folk watched a gog as the strong city troll lumbered past them. Some saw a newborn babe. Others spied a sparkly ball of pink light. Nobody did anything about it wasn't their business if a troll had taken to collecting fairies and wearing them like jewellery round the brim of his hat. They'd seen far worse and knew that sooner or later someone in authority would take notice. Not many people bothered themselves with trolls who could be cantankerous when they were in a good mood. Trolls resembled a badly fitting teenager at odds with his parents, his friends and the world, a teenager who thought life was boring and unfair, one who considered everyone else was having a much better time of it than they were. And because of this attitude, trolls were left well alone. Everybody seemed to think this was just fine, including the trolls. Onk turned back towards the big city skirting around the refuge tip perimeter. Along the way, he poked at odd items with a pointy stick he found in the bushes. He found a pointy stick very useful for finding things, and it often produced some interesting results. Sometimes the results were alive, would scream and run away very fast. Other times, nothing moved when he prodded it. These times, Onk would check if the object was edible, wearable, or just plain handy to have around. As he leaned forward examining objects he found along his route with today's pointy stick, the tiny bauble moved from the fold in his hat, and it rolled round and round the brim, like some bizarre roulette ball on a badly formed wheel. Its light zipped past in slow and fast orbits in time to Onk's jerky movements. As dusk fell, the effect became more noticeable. Fairy folk and woodland creatures paused in their evening toil to watch the curious spectacle pass. Onk was fast becoming a local celebrity. News travelled fast in the magic community due to the flight of noisy birds. None were more vocal than the two surviving magpies Onk had frightened out of their wits earlier that day. 
In need of security after such an ordeal, they perched in the uppermost branches of their horse chestnut tree home, screeching at the top of their beaks about a city troll who'd stolen their pretty. Their plight provoked curiosity, for usually it was other folk doing the angry screeching after a magpie had stolen their treasure. It was rare for these thieves to have the proverbial tales turned on them. News of their upset travelled up Parliament Hill and down the other side until it reached the far corner of Hampstead Heath, where it headed into a sinister wooded grove. Well, I hope you enjoyed Chapter 4. Um, you can subscribe if you want to know when Chapter 5 is coming out and it will let you know. Uh, stay safe and well. Thank you for listening. <laughs>